that I could make? I quickly did. Okay, let's uh, welcome to our welcome. One more piece of business. April 7th, there is a Holy Garden show at the Colony. I signed this up for a booth, 10 by 10 booth. We have the option of selling stuff or not. But we just need a couple people and we're going to get some volunteers to sit there and answer questions. April when? April, Saturday, April 7th, from 10 to 4, I think. Oh, it's a show. You know, basically the Holy Garden show. April 7th, I'll be doing that. What are you going to change? No, I mean, it's the 6th. Oh, so what are the Saturdays? Saturdays and 6th. So, anyhow, and then the proceeds from that, remember, 100% of the proceeds, this is what we did last year, but uh, I don't know how we'll do it this year. That's a separate transaction. So, anyhow, it's just a publicity for a club. Okay, so say that again. April, April Saturday, the April 6th, from 10 to, I think, 4, 10 to 3, I forget what If you're interested, just let me know. That's a matter of sitting at a table and saying, oh, welcome to the Garden Club, and oaks are good, and then lines are bad. Mm -hmm. There's no words about that. We just said, what is it? Carrying the flag. If we wanted to, it would be a two time by table. Did you get April 6th or April 7th? It's Saturday, the first Saturday in April. Right. 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 It's at the Colony at the Humanity Center. The hour for that is 9 to 3. I'm not sure. That, that might be right. I, I'm going by memory now. Yeah. So. Can I say one more thing before I forget? Uh, if you know anyone that wants any other workers, because we don't have everyone here today, so I'm thinking, uh, we're going to send an email out, right? Yeah. Everybody. And uh, you may send an email. Yeah. Just say that. Okay. Uh, again, uh, what I'll be talking about is something near and dear to my heart. I like plants, I like flowers, and all that stuff, but a lot of all in general. So what I'll be talking about is what can we do to encourage wildlife? So I'm going to give uh, a little summary of what can be done. If you spend hours on none of these subjects, but I'll be talking about uh, two different contexts. Is what can we do to support critters? You know, birds, all that kind of stuff. And then there's two, two cases. Uh, and I'm going to be passing on some of our lessons learned, positive and negative. Not everything goes right when you're in a garden, as everyone knows. Now, two contexts is one is backyard gardens, which most of us, many of us have. What can you do to them? And the other case is farms or rural areas. You have to know people, not, you know, something like we have a farm. Some people have ways in the farm. But uh, if you have to know people have farms, then this could be relevant to them. It kind of gives you a clue as to what people, what Texas is doing to encourage other just cow pastures. So that's what we're we'll talking about. So these are some examples of all that. You know, but ultimately, you know, wildlife, you know, everything, even feral hogs and all this stuff, feral God's creatures. So not everything is good, not everything is automatically bad. But some things are better than others. Uh, you know, for example, in a home in a backyard environment, everyone, you know, never pretty much like songbirds, cardinals, and all that kind of stuff. It's universal green on that. And that's good to support. Uh, deer, lots of people like deer. Of course, they're, they're, I know, I know, I know, don't bother me. They eat everything, right? Uh, the raccoons, the raccoons are all kept cute as all get out. Squirrels are cute as all get out. But uh, you can support those or, or control them. Like in the colony, some people feed the dog on deer. Believe it or not. In a farm and rural environment, uh, and we have, we have two farms, uh, same thing applies here. Except now the number of desirable animals goes up. Like you can do songbirds, alternatives, quail, and those are pretty much desirable support. Lots of people are big on doing that kind of conservation. You can like open the opportunity to deer and fish and all that sort of thing. And then raccoons, squirrels, and all that stuff can be good, but can be a problem too. But in any event, you need a plan. Just don't go little and little. Figure what's important to you, and then go from there. So there's essential elements of support of wildlife. Uh, this is from the National Wildlife Foundation 
the essential elements, food, water, cover, shelter, and safe environments for raising the youngs and sustainability. If you want to support wildlife, you have to do those things. Number one is food. Of course, food is a big deal. Uh, everything needs food to live. And uh, one of the things to consider is native plants. Don't fight Mother Nature. Fair point that it's frequently that the, the, the wildlife we're trying to support are used to living for generations before we showed up on what grew naturally. They're not necessarily looking for the latest, greatest arbor bite or whatever it is. And so plants provide food to all kinds of plants. And uh, even the insects, you know, as you plant various things that butterflies eat and other things eat, it's all part of the food chain. So food's obviously important. Now here's an example of sort of a twofer. Uh, food and shelter for birds. So what we have here is, you know, squirrels are a giant challenge. <laughs> And snakes are challenged. We've had problems with both. So what we've done is this is our squirrel and snake food bird feeder. And uh, we actually have our house with ours is two foot taller than this. And so we have netting here, and the snakes grow up that, they get stuck. And so we have uh, we actually have two feeders. This feeder gets we have two feeders kind of like this, and we have to fill them up pretty much every day. So uh, now, one of the considerations of the feeders is squirrels are extremely, extremely persistent. Like you have to have it, they can easily jump six or seven feet. So if you have a tree here, yet yeah, there, that won't work. So when you're thinking about what to do, so what we do is we do a combination of that metal cone and with a skirt, and we make a skirt out of, you know, out of bird netting, and we use three quarters of electrical conduit. Uh, last year, Smithville High School donated one of these, I think it was only about 100 bucks, and they may do that again. Uh, you know, it's a very handy thing. It's not rocket science. Uh, we use, they get steel, three-quarter inch conduit. You can make one of these things, or we can fix you up with one. And one of the keys is it has to pivots down for refilling. Because if the thing breaks it on a bigger one, which is another two feet taller, it's way up in the air, because squirrels are an issue. Uh, you know, there's a wall nearby. So what we have is we have pins there. So you pull up the pin, and me and my assistant lower it down. You fill it up, and you put it up again. So the pins are actually, you know, this is a lot of, a lot of lessons learned over years to come up with the system and have it a distance from trees. So that burn house is actually much higher. Yes, what we do is, uh, that's a good point. And I'll talk more about bird houses. But you, you know, one of the trees is, you never want to bird, bird, avoid putting bird houses on trees, on fence because snakes will get into there. So, uh, so you have that bird house there. Yes, exactly. So you can mount a bird house up here. But to think about where you put, because snakes are an issue, I'll talk more about that in a second. But snakes can be a real issue. Rat snakes can actually climb up, they can climb up that hole. They can climb up what's in there. Why is a big deal? It can go for a whole lot longer without food than it can without water, whether a human or a bird or whatever it is. They need clean drinking water. And you know, there's various forms of water you can do. What we come up with is, is a, an issue with bird baths is that you know, a typical bird bath it's like this deep, holds the empty out of water, and no time flat and evaporates, yeah. and doesn't do any good for the animals, for the birds. What we've done is we've come up with a what we call high, a high capacity bird bath feeder. So what this is, this is a molasses barrel, and uh, what it does is you don't see it in here, but there's a pump in here. And then the pump, when the water, there's a flow here, when the water goes down, this thing refills. There's a hose that comes in here, refills. And, uh, and so you always keep the thing full of fresh water. And to keep it fresh, what we do is, a couple times a week, we go feed this to a drain, and we drain the thing. So here you have 30 gallons of water, which will keep it good for a long time. So you can always have, you know, birds have sufficient quantity of fresh water. So that's what we do the flush Who made that? I did. The school? Oh, you did? I did. Well, actually, we did a combination. It's my design, and I pretty much, well, it was a combination of Smithville High School and me. I'll talk more about what we made, which is. But do they have to sit on something to drink, right? That's a good point. Well, they have wings, don't they? <laughs> no, that's a good point. What you do is this will be about this deep. So what you need is you need 
rocks or something because they want to do bird baths. I'm not a bird expert. What we're doing is we, you know, put in some rocks. So it kind of simulates a realistic environment. Now for rural areas, and this is which I made at Smith High School. This is a project that I supported. This guy is at our farm. So that's a 275 gallon IBC tote. You get those commercially, and 275 gallons is a whole lot of water, and they need to support lots of birds, but we can do deer for a long time with this. So it's 275 gallons. So the compost of this is a 275 gallon IBC tote, plastic thing, painted black so it doesn't get algae. Uh, and then we have rainwater collection here. So the idea is in Texas it rains. Believe it or not, and in uh, one inch of rain, that is 64 square feet of roof. It dumps like 38 gallons of water. People underestimate how much water comes in rain once you've been flooding. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so again, we have the same kind of deal. So we have the irrigation timer. So we have a, we have rainwater collection down here. Essentially, one of these, except this is 30 gallons. That's 275 gallons. According to my calculations, the rain should keep this thing constantly filled. We're going to fill up. We filled it up initially with a hose, and then we have a solar panel which keeps the battery charged. So this is a pretty elaborate, pretty elaborate thing, but it worked out good. Now cover. You need a you know wildlife need cover to raise your young. Without raising young, you're quickly your species kind of tends to disappear. So lots of things can serve as cover for wildlife. So uh, they need cover. They need like, for example, small mammals need things like brush piles. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, lots of things need protection from, from predators. Same thing with predators is a factor. Here's one significant thing that people underestimate is fire ants are terrible things in 27 different ways. Uh, I went with the Texas, uh, I met with the Texas Parks and Wildlife guy. He said one reason that, like, young get killed by fire ants and coyotes and stuff like that is the sensors give off a very pungent smell and then other predators detect that and that's the end of the hill. So, uh, so fire ants is a big deal, just keep that for the suckers. They might outnumber you, but you, you have better living through chemistry. <laughs> so you need uh, you need uh, houses. So what we've done is we have we make houses like this and like that, that's be a nice bluebird house. But there's plans. I'm going to send out this presentation, by the way, on the internet, on to all the members. So this is a bluebird house. One of the considerations of bird houses is the size of the hole is actually a big deal. You know, you don't want it to be so big that like, starlings can set up shop in here. But this hole is actually a precise thing. And we actually set up game cameras in this thing. I mean, cameras, you can see that. So this is a, this is a bat house. And again, this Observe. You want this thing to be uh, kind of. Oh, man. Yeah, man. I can't see that. Right. And also, they need a source of water. I have placed all the bluebird boxes that the Audubon uh, Society has had, so there's a lot of them down in Cobble Vista, the golf course, the golf course, let me put them down there, and then they have a source of water in the ponds and everything. The water's a big deal. You can't develop water. And then the next house is a van, you can go to the duck house. Yeah, and you have to clean them out yearly because yes. those birds will also use those birds. That's a good point. Now they, the other, will, they will build nest on nest, but it's best to get them. And that's a good day. Now there's different schools of thought, but one is, uh, is to flush them out because they can get mites and stuff in there. Uh, so it's a duck house. So we have to do right at the farm and go down the duck. What is that? It's a duck house. Yeah, that's our goal. We have a goal. Everyone's a goal. Like ours is wood ducks. Have to make wood ducks the prettiest bird ever. So they yeah. use that. Yes. So we Jay and I were just there at a farm, and now we're there doing. We have a game camera on both of us, and now we're there. We this one about the So we're just happy to plan so about that. And y'all don't have a pond. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. It's a big, big tank. Maybe. If we ever do a field trip to this thing, that would be great. Oh, we have uh, we can actually Flynn should mention it because uh, we set up we're big on game here, we have a dozen game cameras, and at our house we set up in these things in there in the birdhouse.
we set up cameras, and I have one picture of Janet and her two sisters in their robes, looking at birds in their robes in the morning. I like the light that it whistling does. There, the whole thing. An issue with birds is they tend to disappear very quickly, so that's what the cameras were about. And that's a bad house. school 
they just give us that scrap steel because they make all sorts of heavy stuff and they end up with humongous quantities of scrap steel. But if you actually have a desire to hand one of these, just see when we're done. Say, I like, I like, there's a game camera holder. This is a combination bird feeder and, uh, and bird house holder. So it works out good. <laughs> one of the things is, what kind of model life do we have? Well, it's good, bad, or different. So uh, what we do is uh, we're big on, on census. We like to know what's going on. And, uh, and one of the things I'll talk about is for Texas wildlife, there's actually a thing you have to do a census on these things. I'll talk about that. But you have to say, what do I got? So this is a this is a game, this is a bird cam which goes inside the house. And we have three of these things. That's a terrible picture. You never actually see the birds like that. This is a promotional picture. But this happens to be inside. Since it's infrared, everything ends up being black and white. Uh, this is two eggs, this is a model bird. And we have hundreds of these kind of pictures. Because when birds fledge, they take off like 100 miles an hour. And you never see them again. So you don't know if they're alive, dead. You know, we, we enjoy it. Cookie Janice is nuts about birds. So we see them hatching and all that stuff. So it's cool stuff. If you have a bird, you might as well enjoy it. Oh, it's a bunch of birds. <laughs> is this on the pole or what? Is this like motion activated or what? No, what this is. Uh, this yes, takes yes. a picture of whatever Yes, and yes. What this is, this is motion activated game camera. Yes. And that works out good. We probably have a, we, these are swell things. You get them in Academy. This one's an El Chico, and it's like $25. The good one's like $70. Not a terrible one yet, but it's too hard. There were thousands of pictures in that eight, eight, uh, eight batteries. So they're very good. You can have it at your house, by the way, for security purposes. I want to film some in my house. So they're good high definition pictures. When you do them at night, they end up being black and white. So those are infrared. So we use these for like detecting you know, intruders. We use the feral hogs, we use the deer for a symptom. So the game camera, I'm a huge fan of these things, the game cameras. You said you got a pair? Well, we have, we have one at our house. We have a number of cameras at our house. But we have six of these approximately at our farm. Now, where do you get one? Oh, Academy. Academy. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Amazon. If Mr. Amazon doesn't have you don't need it. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, that's, we're big on knowing what's going on with the baby birds. Now, just a quickie. Uh -huh. Uh, again, we're big on wildlife, and uh, what I'm going to do is just give a little quick overview of what's Texas uh, ag appraisal, because if you have property, what you don't want to do is say, I'm going to sell up and get chocolate to the farmings. We're very sensitive to this, because what's happening in this area is getting more and more populated, and uh, if you have to pay normal property taxes, like if Joyce had to pay or we had to pay, then you're going to set yourself. So we're big on ag for one, we'd like to not pay as much taxes. But, uh, you know, we'd like to avoid being, being chopped in apartments. So, What's the minimum acreage for that? Well, there's two different answers. Okay. Uh, there is 1B1, which is traditional ag. And these, that's what most people think of as ag. So it's cattle, like, goats, even yeah. big bees. It can be that. And what they have is they have animal units. And typically it's like 40 acres approximately 40, 50 acres thereabouts, because you can't raise two cattle to call the business. The IRS is sensitive towards hobbies versus businesses. When you do a traditional uh, ag, you have to run as a business. Now, there's Texas 1D1, which is what I'm a fan of. And there's business doing this. You could spend, there's, you know, there's businesses doing this. They charge for plans and all that stuff. And uh, I'm a fan of this, but this is a do-it-yourself operation. So I'll just give a very brief overview based upon that. And what this is about is the Texas property code provides for, uh, in essence, reduced value. If you have stock, if you have property in ag, it's a dollar an acre a year approximately, as opposed to fair market value. So it's a big deal. Uh, because the property here is, is skyrocketing. The farmland is easily $10,000 an acre around here. And so you can pay, if you have a fair spread, it's fine. So maintaining ag is a big deal because we, we, we like our farmers. So what was the answer to that question? The answer to the question is it's typically like 40 acres. But now you have to, you have, you have to you have, they, don't, they don't have the exact number. What you have to do is you have to show you support uh, a viable business and they have animal units. 
For example, if you have, if you have ten acres worth of very good pasture land and you fed and all that kind of stuff, you could have a viable business on ten acres and say, yes, I'm running a business. Now there's other variations of that. If you're running bees, another long story, and it takes less. But you have to get, you know, you, you have to you have to get approved and you have to have a plan and yada yada. You have to do this with the county and you have to please the county tax appraiser. He tends to you don't want to run a number of foul. That's how we got to help the phone. So the rules you have to apply to. But uh, you know, practical minimum for cattle is probably 40 acres you're doing goats, it's probably small enough you're doing bees, it's even smaller. Pigs. Pigs, that'd be in small. 10, 20, 30 acres. But you have to show you doing this. There's a fork in the road, the traditional ag, and then there's the 1v1 the wildlife slash open space. And then there's a steps in this. In order to go from this, you have to be at this at one point. So you can't go from nothing to one v one. You have to start off with this, but there's lots of land around here that's in this. And one of the issues is there's 70, you know, wild land is owned by 70, 75 year old farmers, and they just uh, they just don't want to, you know, cattle or we just just as a as a way, Janice's family has been having a farm in this area for 130 years. The thing, Ninja's operation got a work from Texas for the farm, right? It's been operation of the same family for 130 years, and they came back to the old world country, so they did farming since, you know, since whatever. So we're big on that. But, uh, you know. I have, uh, I have 40 acres, and we, when we first moved, we didn't have that exemption. But now, I lease the land to my neighbor, and so we keep our land. That's good. There's a caution is uh, if the state of Texas after God after there's gonna be a lot of people in the happy. It's not a long story. I have a I have a thing here which I'll go to in just a little bit. So if the land wasn't cow land, you can't turn it into wildlife? No. If it wasn't ag one D one. People think of one D one traditional as uh, ag is cows. Well, I mean, okay. It, it has to be true. It has to be a ag one d before it could become one d one. It has to be true. It has to be ag. Like for example, in your case, you know, if it's in, it's been in a one d category for like five years or some such number, then you can transition and you can toggle back and forth. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of the deal. There is a steps to go through. Wow. There's forms you fill out, uh, and I have something for those who are actually interested in. There's a form you can fill out for that. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, here is another thing which you can have for anyone actually it's interesting this subject. This is a this is a niche market, but perhaps you know you know people that are into this. Uh, so uh, so basically, you know, again, yeah, you think of it as, uh, as cattle, but you can do bees. Actually, Texas is a big one. Is actually big bees are a big deal. Uh, and not very far business is both rewarding and challenging. So what you have to do is do one D one, you have to do three out of seven activities. Habitat control, rodent control, predator control, supplemental supply of water, supplemental supply of food, shelters, and making census counts. At our farm we do six out of seven. But uh, you know, because you know it's, you know that habitat control is uh, you know it's like brush piles and bird houses and that kind of stuff. Well, what's the one? <coughs> so what's the one you don't do? Uh, rodent control. It's not an issue with rodent. Oh, that's the same. You didn't have land. Right. Okay. You, know, you have to do three out of seven. We actually do some, we have the appraiser and I have a plant for us. Predator control, fire ants, and choose the feral hogs. That's the predator control. Uh, supplemental size of water. We have this wildlife support system, and we have tanks and that kind of stuff. But supplemental can't be just what God gave. You have to take have to take active measures. Supplemental food, so we'll put in food box, We put up bird feeders and that kind of stuff, and uh, shelters. That's like brush piles and uh, and uh, you know bird houses and that stuff. And census and that's the game cameras are for bird for uh, animal poop and tracks and that kind of stuff. So that's the deal. So this is kind of our experience. We uh, we have a 
third 50 acre family farm would come between Jan and us and our various family members. That's been in place for 130 years. And now we have a new, we've had for two years, we got a new 41 acre farm doing 1D1. So we're the best of both worlds. The nice thing about 1D1 is you can't raise cattle, you don't have to. Another consideration for those who think about this, it can be somewhat difficult to prove that you are doing cattle in business. It's pretty hard to prove as long as you show them you can do these things. We are not doing that. I'm doing things to support ducks and deer and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of good. That's kind of good. These are the forms you have to fill and have some of those for extra care. But this is facts and fiction. Uh, one of the things is you have to run, if you're doing traditional cattle and that kind of stuff, it actually has to be a business. It can't be a hobby. So this is, I have some of these sheets that are going to care. And there's this multi-page form you have to do all in it. So it's a bunch of paperwork you have to do. Once you do the paperwork, then you have to do a report once a year. And it fills the form and lets you do it. So we just do that. It's stuff we do anyways. So we did is, this is from the, uh, this is, this is the system of cookery nets that are here. This is what it is. That's a 270 gallons of water. And this is a 30 gallon thing for high protein bird food. So yes. that's like the bird feed in the bird bag? It's two bird bags. So where did the bird bag go into that shelter? That's a good question. Boy, you must be one of my street people. I'm, I'm, what's my plan? A plan, I know. <laughs> no, good question. The question is, where did the birds go? And the answer is, we're not sure to be Because some birds like to fly in the air, some like to crawl on the ground, like quail and stuff like that, and turkeys. And so we're not too sure. So what we do is we have a 30 gallon, it's one of these 30 gallon barrels, which is, you know, an SSO so recycled plastic barrel. So we have one of those for food down here and one on top. And then we have a tray like this on the bottom. And we have a tray like this on the top. And we keep them both filled. And so what we're going to do is we have game cameras to record and see what worked and what didn't. Because it's like a bird spot. Excuse me? It's like a bird spot. There you go. Thank you. My goodness. That's a spot. <laughs> Give that lady a prize. So, uh, so anyhow, what we're doing is we've installed this primary code bar. Uh, we have to do the lessons learned, what works and what didn't, and we have to report on those. So we're going to do an annual report on this and turn it into Bastrop County and say, uh, we did this, we saw feral hogs and all that stuff. So we have, we're going to have two of these game cameras near here, so after our duck house and pond, and we'll set up all the stuff you see here. After we're done here, this is going to go out to the farm for use. And uh, so again, we have a, this is an intern we got picked up. And so he's a, uh, a law life student at uh, Texas State. So his thing is he's going to do uh, research projects. Like he said, well, I heard that if you have quail in your grazing district, you have a 75% chance of succeeding in law. So sign me up. And if you have something which is 75% chance, I have to like quail, turkey, and all this stuff, then life is good. So we're going to do start the quail yet? No, we have to do that. Quail are a special challenge. Yeah. One of the things we'll do in quail and all sorts of things is fire ants. Can I mention fire ants? Because mm -hmm. they'll get it all sorts of ground nesting critters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to do the fire ants, we do the feral hogs, and we do the census. And uh, so that's kind of the deal. So we want to do quail, we want to do, well, we have turkeys and deer and all sorts of things. Anyone you know, likes to have a tour of this? We could do it on a field trip sometime if you like a trip in the country. So Norman, talking about predator control, do you have coyotes and that kind of thing? Not that I know, but we hear them. We yeah. haven't seen them. Coyotes, feral hogs are worse than the coyotes, but that's another story. Feral hogs. Mm -hmm. uh, but feral hogs don't eat any other animals, do they? Oh yeah. What do they eat? Everything. Uh, feral hogs are omnivores. They'll eat anything, including yeah. themselves. Omnivores. Yes, omnivores. They'll eat vegetables, yeah. they'll eat plants, they'll eat critters, they'll eat now, they won't necessarily attack you. You know, yeah, basically, if you get the. If you, yeah, basically, once, they, once, you know, the change, you know, as, as Peggy says, if you get between a mom and her babies. But otherwise, uh, you know, feral hogs, so you, you, it's hard to see a feral hog unless for some reason they have no predators. And the only predator for feral hog it is people. They have no other predators. And so they were in production cycle. The first year, we've got a seminar on this. First year, 
the female reaches sexual maturity, and she can have a litter about every nine months of like six pigs. So start doing your arithmetic on that. And you can see why parabolics can be such a problem. But they're not dangerous, particularly unless you get that. As soon as the word gets out, if you start shooting them, they, when the fair hogs had their staff meetings, whatever happened to Ralph? Well, didn't you hear you got shot? So they're taking off like a rocket. When they see people, they associate them with rifles, uh, and, uh, so you don't put the fear of God in them. Uh, but it's rare to see them. The only one we see fair hogs are farmers. We know we have them, they don't gain hands. They don't dig, they're not rutting up those. Oh, yeah. They're really yeah. Right. So part of their animals that you might want, like hogs, they're predators, so they'll be hungry, like they'll eat their. The rabbits, they eat birds, other birds. Yep. I've seen them catch a bird. I've seen a whole lot of the snake in them. It's all part of God's plan. Right, I know. But I'm saying, so that kind of is in conflict with your supporting the wildlife thing. No, no. Hawks are public. Right. And they have the right to live, too. Feral hogs have no right to live. <laughs> <laughs> zero. No right to live. show in Houston, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago. This is Lance Hansen, who's a great guy at Central High School. By the way, how does teachers put up with students and some mystery to me? What they have to do? Yeah, I guess they're overpaid, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 so, so again, we're doing, we're doing uh, uh, you know, another automation stuff out of high school. High school is mental health, it's great. Oh yes, that's everything. The time bottoms, if they love to root in there, the pecan trees, life is good. Now we have nephews who hunt. There's lots of people who hunt all And then there's night days, so it's all stuff. So what we do is and we have enough to make it worthwhile for the nephews or for one of our neighbors. Say, so, okay, what we do is we set up the feeder so it's like one hour after the dawn and one hour before dusk. Hogs are really, really smart, and they get used to stuff. So what we'll do is we'll get them used to a certain cycle, and we'll see enough worth bothering to come to the state. We'll see if it comes to the right. Yeah, these those cages, they have cages. The cages, it's not practical. Hogs are so smart, they catch one hog. And they're working on it. Well, that's pretty different. You got dumb hogs. But the problem is, the problem is the deer. They get caught in the yeah. Well, that's right. Well, there's different kinds, but you know, our thing is to shoot. The traps are, there's, there's, <coughs> oh yeah, it's illegal to transport hogs. Because they spread disease in their arm or So, uh, uh, is there any yes. Uh, I'll send out this presentation, but, uh, Thank you for your attention, and uh, if we can add, if you're very interested in having any of this stuff yourself, we can yeah, discuss it. Yeah. Well, the back house is very sophisticated. This is a uh, half inch exterior pilot, and it's very stress here. So, this is not rocket science. And then, what we do is we take a little hard to see here, we take hard work off. So, they have a quarter inch mesh. Because you want them to pass the inside. And you just need something. You can cut slots with a saw, but the simplest thing, this is made for high school for me. And we have probably three of these at the farm. But they're kind of cool thing. Absolutely. We have a lot of sorts of things. How about the tank up since it's so big and bulky? Well, we do. We, 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 have, we have various poles. We have telephone poles that are at the farm. Yeah, but still, how did you attach it to the telephone? Oh, sorry about the screws. Oh, no. We do use long screws. What we do here is if you're attaching it, let's say you're going to attach it, you, know, you could attach it to your place, would be attached to the side of your barn, you know, car wall line. Uh, just attach it here. So what we do is uh, these are special high tech holes, and you put a screw through here and then go into the whatever you're attaching to. If you're attaching to a round hole, you can attach a couple screws here. Uh, if you want to replicate one of these things, you can't just sell them, but <laughs> there's nothing to it. Just add things to the You can attach it to trees? You can attach it to trees. Uh, yeah, you can attach it to trees. 
The only thing is run a small risk of the snakes or the raccoon getting into the packs. Really? They do eat packs? Yeah. Nothing. One never knows. And that's in the hole. Well, that's, that's a good point. Uh, and we do attach them to the poles. It's less of a threat. Birds, birdhouse, I know they, they like to get at those things. But the skinny little holes, they might not get us. It's worth going into your place. Like, let's say at your place that you want to attach to the wall. I would, if I were you, I think about making a couple of those things and scattering around. If you get a four by eight sheet of half inch plywood, you can make a bunch of those things. It's two foot by two foot square. It's a furry surface. There's nothing to it. That's any other question? They don't yeah. have to be that big, do they? No. Uh, Bats don't care if it's half It's a matter of how many you want to do. Uh, that happens to be a big size. If you take a four by eight sheet of plywood, uh, that's a three, three thing. So you do the arithmetic on, you know, two foot by two foot is a reasonable size. <coughs> they don't be squashed in there. As long as you're going to do it, just make it a decent size. You know, smaller. If you already have scrap, I have a bench. What's that? If you already have scrap, I have a bench. Yeah, use that exterior plywood. That otherwise would be laying in no time flat. Yeah, if you happen to have stuff laying around, then the price goes even down. Mm -hmm.